Ahoy there folks, I'm Captain Benzi and welcome back to another video for EVE Online. In today's video we're going to be taking another look at some of the naming conventions used for the different ships in the game, and today it's going to be the Triglavian Collective's turn to be analysed. Now the Triglavian Collective are some of the more popular vessels in EVE Online, and I fully understand why. I mean look at the Ikatursa here. These are gorgeous looking ships, they're a lot of fun to fly, they did recently get a slight nerf to how their disintegrators work, but they are still absolutely fantastic vessels, and most importantly for the purposes of this video, they have some really interesting naming conventions. Now, because the Triglavian Collective, actually their Tech 2 ships are not designed by the Triglavian Collective, but by the different empires, yes, really, we'll talk more about that later, it is worth noting that some of these names actually do fall kind of under the conventions of the other four empires, and if you're interested in learning more about the different empires' naming conventions, well, I've already done videos on all four of those, so do make sure to check them out, might give you a little bit more insight into where some of these names have come from, or just give you a little bit more sort of context as to why these names are chosen. Now, if you do enjoy this video, please let me know, drop a comment down below as to which your favourite is, and hit subscribe for more content like this. Otherwise, let's jump straight in. Ah, the Triglavian collective names are heavily influenced by Slavic folklore. That's basically anything from Poland, Russia, Belarus, all sort of that Eastern European side of things. And it's worth noting before we go too far into this, that a lot of the names that you'll see come from different parts of that, and pronunciations do vary. A famous version of this is the Drekovac, which is also Drekovac or Drekovac, depending on whereabouts in Slavic folklore you're actually looking at it. So there's a lot of versatility and a lot of variety in this. And I will do my best with pronunciations, but it is worth putting out there straight off. Yeah, I'm not Slavic, and therefore I'm just going to try my best, and if I make some mistakes, one, they may not actually be mistakes, they may just be the pronunciations that I know from different aspects of Slavic folklore. For example, I tend to say Drekovac rather than Drekovac or Drekovac or Drekovac. There's lots of different ways that you can do this. Secondly, if you are at all familiar with the works of The Witcher, you know, the Netflix series, the games, and of course the original book series, a lot of these are actually referenced there as well, and there will be some minor references there, because that is an intellectual property I do quite enjoy also. Anyway, let's start off then at the bottom of the Triglavian ship tree with their frigates, and first of all, we have the Damovic. Now, the Damovic, sometimes a Damovoi, is a sort of house spirit in Belarusian folklore. They're often depicted almost like gnomes, as little humanoid creatures, usually male, often quite lumpen in the face, not particularly attractive, but they are actually good house spirits. They essentially move into your house, invited or otherwise, and will try to keep your house clean, keep your food fresh. Sometimes it's been mentioned that they will actually even help cooking and things like that. So they are quite sweet, good house spirits, which is a really interesting name for a combat ship, right? A quite sinister looking combat vessel. They have this named after a good house spirit, something that actively you do want to have in your house, is interesting. It should be noted, however, that these are not necessarily good spirits. They're good spirits as long as you care for them and treat them well. As long as your house is amenable to the spirit's presence, then things will go well for you. But like we'll see later with the Kikimura, and I'll talk more about this there, there is a flip side to this. Instead, I think it's more interesting for us to move up to the Tech 2 Assault Frigate. This is the Nurgle. Now, the Nurgle is actually designed by the Galente Federation. They have taken the Damovic blueprint and then have modified it with Galentian ideals. This also is reflected in the name, whereas a lot of the Galente ship tree names are from Mesopotamian or Abyssinian folklore and mythology, Nurgle is absolutely amongst that. You see, Nurgle was the Mesopotamian god of disease, death, and the underworld. If you're at all familiar with Warhammer 40,000, then you know Nurgle, the god spelt slightly differently there, the chaos god Nurgle of pestilence and disease, seen as a bit of a jovial fellow who thinks of his diseases as gifts. And this actually does fit in quite nicely with the Mesopotamian god of disease. You see, Nurgle was also considered to be a bringer of peace, mainly due to the threat of his presence, and ultimately was a very respected god, with beseechments above house doors and lintels and that, 
to essentially ask the god of death, the underworld, disease and peace to not necessarily leave them alone, but to kind of help treat any illnesses that they had whilst keeping some of the more awful illnesses at bay. Now, ultimately, this is a fitting name, I feel, for an assault frigate. It is a bringer of death. It is a, this sort of god of the underworld. It's a great little frigate. I've really enjoyed flying this, and that name does really fit, both with the idea of the ship itself, and it ties in nicely to the Galente ship naming conventions. Moving up to the destroyers, then, we have the Kikimora, one of my absolute favourite ships in the entirety of EVE Online. This is such a powerful little vessel. I have a lot of fun with this, flying it in C2, C3, Wolf Raya systems. C13s are amazing for this. They're very popular in destroyer roams because comparatively to some of the other Triglavian vessels, they are fairly cheap, easy to skill into, and they can do some serious amounts of damage. You can also spider tank these together quite nicely. Now, the Kiki Mora in Slavic mythology is kind of like a Damovic, or rather a female version of a Damovic. It's a Slavic house spirit again, and it can be good or bad depending on how she's treated. When a Kiki Mora moves into your house in Slavic folklore, she will often live in the cellar or even in the stove itself. She might be depicted with the snout of a dog, a chicken beak, can even resemble a goat-like entity with glowing eyes and horns, and some of these, in some of the artworks I've seen, do actually look really quite sinister, but they tend to be quite shy spirits that don't actively get involved in any sort of aggressive way. Instead, they're kind of like teenagers. They can be helpful if they're treated well. Um, they can absolutely be there to, you know, help with, uh, like, housework help with the cooking, help with cleaning the house. There are stories in Slavic folklore of a Kikimora essentially cleaning the house while the residents are asleep, this kind of thing. On the other hand, if they are mistreated, they can be shadowy figures that kind of just sit on the corner of your vision, this strange humanoid thing that can have essentially any part of an animal's face or body, usually feminine and can often appear as an old woman or even a young, beautiful woman. They may appear as a deceased family member, specifically when they are not being particularly well cared for, as a way to sort of torment their victim, their, 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 the people who aren't looking after them. It's also noted they tend to, like teenagers, be quite passive-aggressive and will often break pots or plates. And wild kikimori, and that is the plural of kikimora in Slavic folklore, one kikimora, two kikimori, but in English, remember, we pluralize by our English rules, which is why we say octopuses, not octopi, which also is Latin. If you're actually taking the Greek word, it should be octopodes, but we use octopuses. And the same, we will say kikimoras, but in Slavic it is kikimori. Now, wild kikimori often live in forests or swamps and have even been known to kidnap wayward children. So they can be sinister, but they tend to be a bit more passive aggressive than some of the other spirits we're going to see later on in this video. For the Tech 2 version, we have the Draugr. Now, Draugr is, again, as a Tech 2 vessel, not designed by the Draglavian Collective themselves, but is a modified Kikimora that has been built by the Minmata Republic, hence it has a Nordic name. Now, in Nordic mythology, a Draugr, often spelt without the second U here, just D-R-A-U-G-R, is a kind of undead creature in Scandinavian mythology and folklore. They're revenants animated corpses, the original version of the Barrow Whites, the idea that you might look across the Barrow Dens and see some of the, uh, the Barrows actually glowing as the corpse inside it has come alive with a baleful gaze that walks through the mists and fogs of the early twilight into the witching hour of the night. Very sinister creature. They are hideous to look at, often depicted with dark, blackish, bluey, grey skin. Not very sort of humanoid anymore. It's a humanoid corpse, but it's had this real ethereal otherworldliness added to it. They have immense strength, can sometimes be depicted as ridiculously fast. Think of the zombies in 28 Days Later, for example. Um, and they are often depicted as greedy and jealous of the living. They want 
all of the things and that includes the lives that they no longer have and they are very aggressive very powerful spirits that can often be very hard to kill there are bits of uh, nordic folklore where draugr withstand blow after blow from mighty axes and swords and hammers and just keep on going and it's often full decapitation and burning of the body actually requires to kill them now, interestingly enough, in my opinion, this is a bit of an unusual name. Like, it kind of fits, I get it, it's a revenant, undead spirit, aggressive thing. It's a destroyer, right? But this is a command destroyer. And as far as raw firepower and survivability go, the Draugr does actually sacrifice some of the Kiki Mora's capabilities. So it's an unusual name that fits, sort of. I wouldn't change it, per se, but there are certain aspects to the name that I don't feel particularly fit the vessel itself i don't know what else i would go for here it definitely works i'm not saying it's a bad thing but eh, maybe you've got an idea let me know in the comment section down below let's move on then to the cruisers so we'll start off with the vedmak again we're going back into hardcore triglavian collective slavic mythology names now a vedmak in slavic mythology is a male witch often mistakenly referred to as a warlock if there are any wiccans in the audience listening to this yes i understand the difference a, a, a witch is a practicer of magic whereas a warlock is an oath breaker so often it's referred to as a warlock but that doesn't actually like track with the mythology they are male witches or shamans and they treat people and animals so they are kind of your helpful characters for the most part think of your old man hermit who lives in the woods and understands herbology and all this kind of thing and just wants to help people out when he can but for the most part be left alone to whatever it is he's doing now on the other hand they are thought to be connected to the devil of course with christianity spreading across europe from the uh, the south southeastern side of europe and a lot of this does happen with pagan traditions that are based on witchcraft, wizardry, science, understanding and learning, shamanism, this kind of thing, often just being attributed to the Christio, uh, Christian Judeo devil um, as a way of persecuting them and helping to, you know, bring that Christian control, I suppose. They're supposedly capable of bringing harm by sending illnesses, killing cattle, spoiling a harvest, that kind of thing. Now, the word often was used by an insult by those Judeo-Christians as well, that someone who is seen as a bit of a recluse or a shutaway, a bit of a weirdo, someone who just kind of kept to themselves, ah, you're a Vedmak, you're a Vedmak. Now, a Vedmak can also turn into any animal or object, it is said, as part of their shamanic powers. Now, in fact, in the, uh, the, the Witcher novels, the word used for Witcher in the original Polish version of the novels is, and forgive my pronunciation here, Vezmen, which is very close to Vedmak, and was coined by Sapkowski, uh, Sapkowski himself as a neologism, with the word Vezmak, cognate of Vedmak, it's used in the book only as a derogatory term for the witches themselves. Nice little bit of side, you know, going there into the, the, the witcher mythology, so yeah, there's that. Then we have the Rediva. Now, the Rediva is the, uh, the, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? The uh, logistics vessel here. It is the remote armor repairer. And Rediva in Slavic, Slavic mythology was Rediva Deva, the great fertile goddess who brings fruitful and fertile life on Earth. Also compared to Nerthus, a Germanic goddess with the same traits. Now, this makes absolute sense, right? We're talking about a logistics vessel. We're talking about repairing up your friends and those other people in your fleet. So having this tied into a fertile goddess of fruitful and fertile life does really make sense, right? That really ties in quite nicely. And I think that one really, really works. Now, before we go on to the Tech 2 ships, I do just want to remind you that if you are enjoying this content and you want to help support this channel, you can do that in three different ways. First of all, they're the old ways of Patreon or my PayPal tip jar. You can make small donations there to help support the channel, and every one of them is very gratefully received. It means the world to me. But I've also now activated on YouTube 
channel memberships. You can go across to the channel membership link. It's also linked in the description of this video. And for two to five pound a month, you can get a load of really cool perks here right on the channel that are going to give you things like loyalty badges that show how long you've been supporting. Um, you get dedicated responses. It flags your replies to my videos to me directly so I can make sure that I am responding to you. You even can get early access to any video that I upload. So this one, for example, I'll, once I finish this, it will be uploaded and it will be released for channel members who get to watch it immediately, whereas it will then be released at a future date for other people on the channel to watch. Finally, I've also got Super Thanks activated. So if you just want to do a a quick one-off donation you can buy me a super thanks and it helps support the channel and you can get your name shouted out in future videos and have it show up beneath the video as well which is really cool anyway enough of the self shilling let's move on to the tech 2 cruisers first of all we have the heavy assault cruiser the ikatursa one of my favorite ships in the game as well yes you'll notice both the kiki Gamora and the ikatursa are two of my favorite ships in eve online the ikatursa is amazing i love this vessel so much it's versatile it's powerful it looks badass and its name is also really cool now the ikatursa being a tech 2 ship not designed by the triglavian collective it is a modified vedmac that has been designed by the kaldari state as such the name for it actually comes a little bit away from slavic mythology and into finnish mythology where the Iketurso, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, which translates directly as the Eternal Turso, is a malevolent sea monster found in the Finnish mythology of the Kalevala. And if you're also thinking, hang on a second, isn't Kalevala Expanse a region in EVE Online? Yes, it is. Those were actually named by the players when the uh, when the drone lands opened up. And in my mind, that was actually before the Ikatursa was added to the game. So we've got two nice bits of Finnish mythology, but they are completely unrelated to each other. Now, the Ikatursa, as I said, is a malevolent sea monster. Think kind of like a Kraken, kind of like Cthulhu. Some of the translations in the Kalevala refer to it as like a beast with a beard, which could refer to a mass of tentacles around its face. It's also often referred to as the thousand horned creature, which again could be tentacles, could be literal bony protrusions and horns. We don't honestly know. It's a mythological creature, right? mythological creatures working quite nicely with the Kaldari naming convention. Now, in the Kalevala, it's often referred to the Ikatursa as the father of diseases, with Leviathar, the blind daughter of Tuoni, the god of death being sort of its consort, I think. I may have that bit wrong. Later on in the Kalevala, Ikitursa is summoned by Luhi, the Lady of the North, to stop the theft of the magical artifact Sampo. Now, this next name, I apologise, I'm going to butcher this to all hell because there's way too many dots above the letters in this. Vainamoinen, the leader of the Plunderers, grabs Ikaturso from his ears and using magical words makes him promise to never return from the bottom of the sea. Now, it's not ever fully explained what this grabbing him from the ears means. It is clear. I have went through numerous different translations here. It does say he grabs him from his ears, not by his ears. It's not like this guy, this woman, uh, uh, this person, Vainamoinen, however you pronounce that, reaches into the water and grabs Ikaturso by his ears, but seems to be actually grabs him out of his ears as if to say stop whispering to me stop speaking to me no you must promise to never return from the bottom of the sea and darken this again and as far as we know if Ikiturso ever did exist if it's not just your made-up mythology if it's based in any sort of history then it is possible that that has happened it's gone back beneath the waves maybe to never be seen again in his house Pasulu lies sleeping anyway Moving on then from the Ikatursa, one of my favourite ships in the game, to one I've never actually flown, the Zarmaj. And again, for any Iranians in the audience, I do apologise if I'm butchering that pronunciation as well. And why do I say Iranians? Well, because there's a lot of Persian reference going on here. The Zarmaj is a ship that is designed by the Amar Empire, and so it has those religious judeo-christianity traits to it just like we see with other ships in the amar empire ship tree now this actually has two interesting links in persian the word for gold is czar and wisdom is majd so czar majd could be a literal translation of golden wisdom 
Now, literally, this is gold as in the coin, the metal, that kind of thing. But you could also take it with the, the, the idea of golden wisdom, divine wisdom, that sort of utterance from God. Perhaps that could be a way of looking into this, or it could just be a reference to the gold colour that the Amar Empire do like so much on their ships, and I'm not particularly a fan of. On the other hand, we have a bit of a portmanteau situation going on, with Ormajd being the Iranian creator deity and god of the sky in the ancient Iranian religion of Zoroastrianism, and Zartosht, or Zoroaster, was a religious reformer and the spiritual founder of Zoroastrianism. And how do those two go together? Well, we're looking here at Ormajd and Zartosht. So if you take Zartosht and Ormajd and put them together, you get Zarmajd, right? Now, supposedly, uh, Zoroaster, Zartosht, was the first documented monotheist, he founded Zoroastrianism, which is the first documented monotheistic religion in the world, and also had an impact on Plato, Pythagoras, and the creation of the Abrahamic religions, Judeo, uh, Ju Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Now, the Zoroastrians believed that he was a prophet who transmitted God's messages and founded a religious movement that challenged the existing traditions of ancient Iranian religion. While in the minority Ahmadiyya branch of Islam and in the Baha'i faith, he is also considered a prophet. Now, this all really ties in quite nicely with that Amar Empire sort of quasi-religious thing going on there. Whichever way you take to look at it, whether it is a portmanteau of uh, Zartosht and Ormazd, or whether it is the Persian Zar or uh, Zar Majd, meaning gold wisdom, that's up to you. I think this really works, though. It is on so many levels very Amarian, whilst also having that sort of influence with the fact that this is a remote armor repairing ship. It does twin into that really really nicely and if you've ever fl gone up against a fleet of Triglavian vessels um, that happen to have a Zarmaj with them you'll know how utterly fearsome the remote armor repairing capabilities of this can be and how hard it can break the tank of that particular fleet makes sense great ship um, not one I fly personally because I'm not much of a logistics pilot but a very powerful one I've got to say as well I do absolutely adore the way this ship looks it's Triglavian but it's also really quite angular and almost insectoid but anyway let's move on in the battle cruisers we have the Drekovac or Drekovac, Drekovac, Drekovac there's lots of different ways you can pronounce this depending on where in the Slavic region you are looking so all four of those pronunciations are ones I have heard people refer to as quote unquote correct so don't at me on that bit at least. Now, a Drekovac literally translates as the screamer or the screecher, often also referred to as a Drekalo or Krekovac, Zrekovac or Zrikavac is a mythological creature in Southern Slavic mythology. The name is derived from the verb Drekati, meaning to screech or to scream. Now, these are depicted as everything from a reanimated corpse to a canine-like creature that walks on its back legs to a kind of vampire. If you think those kind of really ghoulish vampires, the ones with the grey skin, the glowing eyes, and the massive long fangs, yeah, that's kind of the imagery we're going for here. Now, sometimes a Drekovac is the soul of a dead child lost before its time. Sometimes it's the soul of a soldier who died horrifically in battle. This varies. There are other interpretations as well. But these are creatures that stalk the Slavic forests at night after dark, will screech at you from a distance, and if you happen to come across one, well, pray to whatever god you happen to believe in, son, because you are not going to enjoy what happens next. These are very much evil, vindictive, malicious, aggressive, very powerful creatures. Think of the Draugr, as we talked about earlier. Hard to kill, hard to even avoid. It's said that once a Drakovac's screech has been heard, that's it. Yo doomed, you ain't getting out of there with your life. And there are certain versions of the Drekovac myth that actually suggest that if you yourself are killed by a Drekovac, guess what? You become one. Just like a vampire, just like a zombie, just like so many other things. It's a brilliant bit of mythology. I love it to pieces. 
Let's move on then now to the battleships. We have the Le Shack, and this is a really great one. Actually, I learned quite a bit about this. Now, I obviously know from The Witcher that you have the Leshy, but looking into Slavic mythology, you also have Leshy, or Lesovich, being a male woodland spirit in Slavic mythology, kind of like the old man of the forest. He protects wild animals and forests, he is there as a protector of green spaces, cut down his trees and you're going to make him angry. Get lost in the forest and be of good heart and he might help you out. Be struggling to escape oppression, run into the, fo uh, the forests to flee, you know, an attacking band of soldiers or whatever and Leshy may lead you to a nice clearing away from your uh, attackers, may even show you the way to berries and clean water and this kind of thing. So it can be a good force and a bad force. He's a primordial force. It's not about good or bad or good or evil. It's about how you interact with him, right? Now, in the Witcher books, a Leshy is also this weird monster that can be almost like a, a feline creature that jumps from branch to branch um, and then can turn into these gigantic humanoid tree-like ent creatures with horns and skulls and bodies made of bark. They're very much that very primordial aggressive spirit, um, like a humanoid monster that looks to be made of trees. They're one of the more iconic monsters, and if you actually played Monster Hunter when they did the Witcher crosho crossover, when they did the Witcher crush over, it was actually... <clears throat> my mind is unravelling. It was actually the Leshy that was added as the creature that you hunted, and I loved that hunt in Monster Hunter World. That was a great little crossover, and was so much fun to do. Um, but the Leshek... Uh, controversial opinion, I don't like flying this thing. I don't like flying this thing. It's not, in my opinion, a particularly good ship. It's a very popular ship. It's great for structure bashing, but for actual PvP roams or for, you know, ratting and things like that, it has problems, right? It's a big, unwieldy, tree-like battleship that takes a long time to do anything. It's very powerful, um, but not the most subtle of vettel vettels. Vettels. Vessels. Vessels. This is why you should, you know, support the channel with a channel membership or a donation on Patreon or PayPal because you help me buy a coffee so that my voice doesn't do this. Finally, then, we come to the Zernitra. I had no idea what this was when I started looking into it, and oh my goodness, wow. Very happy with this one. The Zernitra comes from Wendish culture, which is sort of a Western Slavic group that had historical battles with the Saxons. Saxons were a Germanic tribe who eventually moved across to what we now know as England. In fact, that's kind of where the name comes from, because we had the Anglo-Saxons. England. England, right? Anyway, so the Wendish was a culture often at war with the Saxons, and in their culture, in their Slavic tradition, the Zernitra was a mythical dragon deity, boys. Mythical dragon. Also known as Zir or Roshvodish. Roshvodiz? Roshvoditz? One of those. Representing the god of sorcery. And its image was used as a symbol of resistance during those Wendish Saxon conflicts, painted on shields and banners and things like that. This gigantic black dragon. Now, this also has connection with the weather and water in Slavic folklore, that Zernitra, this black dragon deity, was capable of producing pure water for the Wends to drink, and also could control the weather. So every time the, uh, the Saxons attacked, only to be pushed back by a thunderous storm across the mountains and forests that sent them running, that was Zenitra's work, right? That was this gigantic black dragon going, No, be gone, Saxons, you shall not harm my people. Yeah. And ultimately, Zenitra was believed to possess the ability to control the climate and acting as this source of fresh water for the troops. It's also arguably where the concept of the black dragon in Dungeons and Dragons comes from this idea of pure water and acid being tied into how black dragons are portrayed in Dungeons and Dragons. Being this large black reptile with curled horns, does that sound familiar? Being this aggressive, pernicious, capricious creature that would just as soon swallow someone whole as it would assist them. Yeah, sounds kind of like a black dragon to me. And yeah, I may not like the look of the Zenitra, but 
having the, the Triglavian capital, their dreadnought, being named after a freaking black dragon deity of sorcery, weather, and water, that's badass no matter which way you look at it, right? That's so cool. That is so cool, and I had no idea. But also looking at the Zenitra, you kind of can almost see this. It's got the horns, the curled horns to the side. It's got this gigantic chin. It's almost, if you look at it, like a dragon with its mouth open. I love this. I love the name. I love, you know, the, the mythology behind this. Ah, I learned something from this. I learned something from this. And if you learned something from this, well, I think you owe me a like on the video and a subscription to the channel if you aren't already subscribed. It's completely free, it helps support the channel, helps keep content like this coming straight direct to your inbox and your notifications so that you never miss anything, right? That's 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 why we do these things. Subscribe, ding the notification bell, and yeah, enjoy more content like this in the future. Now, before we round this one off, that may be the Triglavian vessels there and their naming conventions. Tell me what you want to see next, because we've still got Serpentis, Angel, Blood Raiders, Sanchez Nation, Gurustus Pirates, Sisters of Eve, Mordu's Legion, and the Edencom ships. Which of these would you like me to see cover next? Drop it in the comments below, let me know. And of course, if you are a channel member, you'll often get direct access to polls as to what content you would like to see me work on in the future. So maybe consider doing that as well. Anyway, folks, thank you for watching this one right the way through to the end. I hope you learned something. I hope you've enjoyed this one. I hope you had fun. Thank you for watching. Happy sailing and see you in New Eden.